Hey everyone, so this is the chapter 13 uh, lecture video for our, excuse me, lecture map video for our Medic 225 class. Uh, chapter 13 covers how to manage uh, paper medical records in the medical office. So uh, I usually try to record videos during the day when my house is empty, but I am recording this video uh, in the evening when everybody in my house is home and my dogs are kind of hyper. We just got back from a walk not long ago. So uh, I'm going to try to get through this as quietly as possible, but I'm not promising that you're not going to hear uh, dogs in the background, their tags rustling, or a kid walking in and out uh, of the door. So if you hear that background noise, I apologize for that. Bear with me. Uh, you know, Mom life and work life sometimes commingle and uh, don't do so seamlessly. So uh, there's my little disclaimer about background noise. Uh, oh, there goes one of them. So uh, the first thing that we always start the lectures out with are the questions that we want to be able to answer by the end of the lecture. And uh, the first question is, uh, what is the uh, common equipment that is used to file and store paper medical records in the medical office? The second thing we want to know is which security and safety measures should be employed when working with paper medical records? Third, what are the common filing supplies used in the medical office? Fourth, we want to be able to contrast the methods used for various filing systems. And then we're going to try to figure out how color coding can assist with the filing systems. Uh, fifth, we're going to, uh, we should be able to uh, figure out what the steps are in the filing process. I need to actually change that. And uh, lastly, we want to know what are the differences between active, inactive, and closed files, and how do we go about setting up a records retention program for the office? So let me put a question mark there. Um, and so we begin with uh, talking about the different types of filing equipment. Uh, the very first thing that we discuss is the records, ma records management system. So the records management system is the method in which patient records are created, filed, and then ultimately maintained for the duration of the time that they are with the practice or with the, the provider. So filing equipment uh, refers to the place where those records are then kept. Space allocation is the protection, um, or excuse me, space allocation and protection of protected health information, which is what PHI is are very important things that we want to make sure that we are considering when we are designing places to keep those uh, medical files, medical charts. Um, and so when we're looking at places that we are going to be storing charts, we want to make sure that the filing shelves um, are uh, out of sight of patients, if possible, um, that they have um, locks, if those are available, um, that uh, if you know you if they are going to be places where patients may walk past them and have access to the names that are on the spines of the files, that they perhaps have doors that slide over them to protect the names that are on the the spines of the files. So the filing shelves could be open, they could have doors that can be locked, um, they sometimes come in vertical styles uh, that are taller with narrow drawers, um, they also come in lateral styles which are more commonly known as horizontal files and those can be sp uh, split into three or four wider uh, drawers. They um, 
oftentimes you will end up seeing compactable files and those will be uh, really good for uh, offices that are smaller and have limited spaces available to them for their file storage. So here's the thing, EHRs have been mandated since 2014 and so more and more in the coming years you will see less and less paper charts or these um, uh, medical, uh, thick medical charts and these stacks and stacks and walls and walls and racks and racks of of uh, paper charts. So because they have been converted over or will be converted over to electronic health records. So um, most of the time the only ones that are really hanging around in physicians offices now are the ones that are archived that we have to um, still hang on to. I don't know how to get this off here. This my these little Facebook thing. I don't even know who this dude is, but these little Facebook things pop up on here. They drive me nuts. I don't even know how to make them go away. So sorry about that. Um, so there's a rotary circular file uh, that helps when there are space constraints. They um, work similar to a, like a revolving door. You know those doors. <laughs> My kids are scared to go in those doors. They go um, those doors where you walk in and then somebody walks in it behind you and everybody kind of pushes it forward. Oh my gosh, hang on, I'm gonna pause you and try to figure out how to get rid of that. Okay, I'm back. I think I figured out how to get those stupid things off of there. So frustrating. Um, okay, so back to this rotary circular uh, type of filing apparatus. Uh, they, again, work very similar to those doors, those revolving doors that you walk in, where you walk in, it looks like kind of like a pinwheel. You walk in and then another person walks in the door into the section behind you and you kind of just keep walking in and people pushing them forward and that's how the door is uh, rotated and powered. Um, so it works very similar to that. You turn the system uh, manually. Some of them are electronic, um, but it's kind of like a lazy Susan, if you will, if you are um, old enough to remember what those are. Um, and then, and it works like that for medical records. So regardless of whatever system is being used, it, it's not going to work if the files are not accurately labeled for easier retrieval. So uh, labeling is what is most important about records management systems um, and labeling becomes incredibly difficult if um, the appropriate filing supplies, which we're going to get to in just a minute, is not are, are, are not used or if things aren't alphabetized correctly um, or so forth. So before we get to the filing supplies part, we'll talk about uh, what things are important uh, regarding security and safety measures when it comes to paper charts. So it's much easier, I'm sure you will probably have noticed by now, to keep things locked up in the computer because you don't run the risk of somebody, you know, um, seeing papers laying out on a desk or anything. I mean, there's the possibility of somebody seeing something left up on a screen. Um, or hacking into a system. So there's certainly um, potential risks involved with electronic health systems, which we'll talk about in another chapter. But uh, with paper charts, uh, they pose their own risks. So um, with paper charts, there's no backup to those charts. So there's nothing saved anywhere if there's a fire or a flood or a hurricane or earthquake or anything where those medical records are damaged uh, and all that is there is a paper chart then um, those medical records are damaged and they are just gone so you have to try to recreate them and that um, more often than not proves to be a very difficult task to do so um, when we are talking about security and safety measures for our paper charts I just want to um, note here again, and I know that this whole chapter is revolving paper charts, but just to be sure that you all remember, we are talking about paper charts here, and um, we want to make sure that we are complying with HIPAA privacy and security regulations which require us to perform reasonable safeguards to make sure that we are protecting our patients health information uh, at all times. 
We are also need to make sure that we are locking up any files at the end of each day where medical records are stored. And we want to make sure that the uh, medical records are stored in a private area and that that private area has signs on it that says authorized personnel only. That way that there is no um, confusion about whether or not patients are allowed access to that area. So usually it's like a medical records room um, and it will say staff only, authorized personnel only, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then occasionally it is worth the time to do security drills to raise awareness to make sure that that is not easily accessible, um, or that those medical records are not easily accessible by inappropriate um, persons. So we want to make sure uh, if we have a locking system that the security of the keys for the cabinets and the rooms are also protected. Typically this will end up falling with um, the keys will be with an office manager or the medical records manager. So I'll, let me write that in there. Med rec or office manager. Um, some practices will even have an alarm system. One practice that I worked for um, had like an electronic keypad uh, where we, you had to punch in a, a number on the door to get into the uh, medical records room. So, I mean, even the people who were working in the room that would look at you through the window and talk to you through the window and knew that, I mean, like I worked with those people, they couldn't let me in. So I had to put in my own key code to get into medical records whenever I need to go in. If there are keys and locks, um, but no one is responsible for making sure that they're used, uh, sometimes a security survey team can catch a facility who does not have their record secured. So it doesn't do any good to have safety guards in place if nobody is enforcing them. Um, and I mean, it's kind of like having locks on your cars or a security system on your car and then not using it. And then, you know, your car is just kind of hanging out out there at risk. So, um, performing regular security drills at the same time that uh, fire drills are held uh, sometimes will help staff in being aware and a little bit more um, keen and, uh, and uh, able to identify security risks where their medical records, their paper charts, I should say, uh, paper medical records are involved. All right, so moving on to filing supplies. Uh, the first thing you're going to want to know is what types of things you're going to need in order to create these paper charts. Uh, the odds of you having to do this are probably pretty slim these days, um, but it's good to know what it is you'll need to do in the event that your uh, EMR goes down and you have to create paper charts for patients. Um, for a day or two. So if you do that, uh, you will need first a manila folder that can either be letter size or legal size. So letter size is the size of a piece of paper and like a normal printer piece of paper and legal size is the bigger one. So let me write that up here. I don't remember the measurements for them. I think letter is eight and a half by eleven, and then uh, I think legal may be like eight by fourteen ish. So I think this is eight point five by eleven inches. I think that's like eight by fourteen for legal, something like that. Um, so then you're also going to need some tabs, and the tabs extend the full length of the folder, um, and so they uh, come in a variety, they may be in a variety of locations, and so uh, they're usually spaced in thirds um, to spread the area for labels so that all the labels aren't lined up one behind the other, and so when you are looking, I'm going to go down here and uh, draw a little uh, label tab thing. And so when you are looking at a file folder label, and so if this is your file folder, you've got like a tab here. And then if you have another file folder, 
you may have another tab back here. And then if you have another file folder, you may have this because I'm not an artist people. I don't I don't teach art, so don't make fun of me, okay? Um, but you may have another file folder with the tab back here. And that and so these tabs are usually about a third of the length of the folder and they are spaced um, in various locations and so you may have something um, so that it looks like you have um, Do Jane Do John Do Joe and so you can stagger them then um, and have them uh, all the names visible is basically what it amounts to. So that's kind of what they're talking about with the label with the tabs there. Um, the labels are used to identify the folder's contents. Hanging file folders, they have these little hooks that come out the side. Um, they're like little metal bars that run the length of the inside of the folder. And then there'll be like a little metal hook that comes out the side, kind of like this. And it will hook onto the side of a metal bar in a file folder. Um, excuse me, what's that thing called? <sighs> file cabinet. Oh my god, how did I forget that? A file cat is late, that's why. A file cabinet drawer. And um, that allows those folders to slide along the file cabinet drawer uh, much easier. And then uh, some of the folders will have, some of those folders will have plastic tabs. I hate those little plastic tab things, um, but some people love to use them. Uh, and those little plastic tabs also serve as labels for the hanging file folders. And so what happens is you have hanging file folders and then you place the charts, the manila folder inside the hanging file. It's very confusing. If you ever want to see it in person, stop by my office, GE109B. I will show you how the whole thing works. Because I have charts that look like this with my clinical students' uh, information hanging in there. I'm a creature of habit, so I still create charts that look like medical record charts, like a weirdo. And uh, then I've got these kind of charts in there. So if you want to see what it looks like, come on over. Three ring binders are sometimes used instead of folders. They're stronger but they take up a lot more space and uh, to be honest with you they take up a lot more space and not a lot of people have the kind of space that it takes with three ring binders okay so you get a lot of manila folders and that's just that file guides uh, helped to separate folders and uh, make finding those uh, charts easier make retrieval easier and then whenever you pull a chart out, an out guide serves as a marker or placeholder whenever that chart has been removed. And so what the out guide does is helps ensure that the chart or the folder is placed back in the right spot whenever you're done with it. And that's all that does. Um, and then sometimes when you have a whole bunch of stuff to sort through that needs to be filed, you can use um, something called an accordion style file and it basically looks kind of like an accordion um, and it's usually got the whole entire alphabet on it so there's like 26 slots on it and you can use it to shove a whole bunch of papers in and help you sort uh, things out temporarily until you can get them put into their permanent locations. And so that's kind of it for filing supplies. So once you get all your supplies gathered up, you work out your system. And the first thing you need to do is figure out what type of system you're going to use. And then you figure out the process. So you have a few options for filing systems. Uh, the first one is uh, sequential order. And that one can follow various pattern options for quick retrieval of patient information. You don't see that a whole lot. What you do see a lot is an alphabetic filing system uh, and that is one that arranges patients medical records in alphabetical order following specific indexing rules. 
uh, which consider each part of the patient's name as a unit. So um, usually it will go by last name first, so I'm going to write this over here. The alphabetical system will almost always, in almost in every office I have ever worked in, and every hospital I've ever worked in, let me find my pen, make my pen register, oh there it goes, it is last name, first name, middle initial. So that's how it has always been. Um, if you ever find some place that does it differently with an alphabetical filing system, let me know. Uh, that way I can use it as, as an example the next time I do this lecture. Chronological filing is a filing system that is sometimes used, albeit uh, all, not very often. It is based on dates, um, and that is uh, uh, where they file with the most recent uh, files by date on top, and that is known as reverse chronological order. Now, this is more chronological filing is used more often inside the chart. And it is for labs, chief complaints, referrals, that kind of thing, okay? So this is chronologicals inside the chart. And so basically what happens is the patient comes in and whatever it is that they're being seen for goes right on top. And so as you dig deeper into their chart, the older the information is, the closer to the bottom you get. So that's kind of how chronological filing works. Um, and actually, I said that's not used very often, and that's not true. It's used, actually, that's pretty much standard for inside of a paper chart, um, the chronological filing. And that's where we use the reverse chronological on the inside of the chart. The one that the one I was thinking of is a numeric filing system uh, is not used as often as the alphabetic filing system for the external labels of the chart, um, and that is because obviously alphabetic is much less confusing than this numeric filing system. But this is what I can tell you is that the numeric filing system. Um, which organizes files by numbers and a master list is, has to be kept in order to correspond the medical record with the patient's name and um, it's also known as the indirect filing system. This type of um, uh, filing system has a, a couple of different ways you can do it. There's terminal digit filing which is depends on the last two or three numbers for organization, where they go lowest to highest. They also use middle digit filing. It gets super confusing with this numeric filing system and where they do terminal digit and middle digit. I actually used to make students do assignments for terminal and middle digit filing, and you will be very happy to know that you are the first class in probably the last 10 years that I am not making do this assignment. Um, so I will tell you that places that tend to use numeric filing systems are places um, like um, uh, counseling, drug treatment, um, places like uh, sexual health, and STD clinics. So it's basically places that um, where privacy is more of a concern. So 
So here's the thing. Um, when you go into a standard general practitioner's office or family medicine office, you're probably not super worried that there's going to be some rando, like, uh, in there searching for incriminating information on Lucy Brown's, you know, medical record. It's probably mostly just colds and stuff, you know, and she may have had, like, every STD known to man, but the odds of a, a, a ran, you know, of a person um, intentionally going in there with uh, harm, to do harm to her medical record or to access her medical records is probably much less likely than it would be in a place where there is known sensitive information such as uh, assault centers, drug treatment centers, sexual health centers, STD clinics, places like that where you know that the information um, that is going to be in those medical records is going to be of such a nature that it is sensitive um, and that it is perhaps controversial to um, family members or to people um, that are associated with the patients that uh, patronize those clinics. So sometimes those types of of um, facilities will use those numeric filing systems in order to help further protect patients' um, identities. All right, so uh, once you've got those options up there, the other option, um, you have a color coding option. I freaking love color coding. And color coding, um, no, for real, like I really do. I color code like pretty much the shit out of everything. I love color coding. So um, once you, you can decide to color code or you cannot decide to color code, but color coding is fantastic. And you can uh, color code in combination with one of the above filing systems which is really nice. So color coding is used for a quick visual cue of, on distinguishing files. And I don't know if you caught on to this yet, but I totally color coded this map and I do that a lot. So for instance, this filing system is all surrounded. They're all outlined in orange. Over here, question, orange. That's the answer. Answer is in orange. The next one's green, green. So Color coding, color coding helps you with visual cues, people. See, see what I did there? Mm -hmm. Color coding is amazing. Uh, classifications, color coding uses classifications, uh, such as Medicare patients, or um, it could denote a classification such as a specific patient population, like they may use pink for pediatrics. You'll get this a lot um, when you work in a hospital, like they'll say code blue. Uh, that usually means that somebody is, has a lack of oxygen, they're flatlining, you need to get a crash cart and go help them. Code pink means that there's been an infant abduction. Uh, code, I mean, there's like, there's all these codes, right? They make you know the code colors because that is an indicate code red means that there's probably a fire someplace or you have all these code colors. So they color code things um, to denote specific situations. And we do the same thing with charts. We can color code them to denote specific pa patient populations, um, which will help us quickly identify uh, that, hey, that pink chart doesn't belong in this section because this is the adult section of charts and that's a pediatric chart, so it shouldn't be over here. Um, or, hey, that gray chart is a Z chart and all of our, all of these charts are the C charts, and these are all blue, so that gray one doesn't belong over here. So that's how color coding can help there. Um, a chart should be posted to help with identification of the color system's groupings, if that's what you're going to do with a classification system. Um, color is used in an alphabetic filing system, like I just said. Uh, it's done with colored stickers, with each letter having a distinct color, kind of like I just gave you the example with the C and Z. Uh, misfiled charts are easily noted with this method, so that's nice. You can do the same thing with color coding and a numeric filing system. Uh, it's similar for like it is with alphabetic, it's just you do it with a number, each number having a specific color instead of each letter. Um, so when we're talking about supplemental files, 
The supplemental files may be needed um, for any information that is kept separately, such as financial and insurance information. Um, but generally, we're going to follow whatever primary system is used by the office. And I'll tell you, we don't normally keep supplemental files. Like, pretty much everything, um, and I'm not even going to write this here, if I can make my pen work. Pretty much everything stays in one chart. Now, patients can have more than one volume. So patients can have multiple volumes of a chart. So there's that option. I mean, like if their chart gets so thick that they can't fit anything else in that manila folder, then we just start a second volume. And then build on that one. All right, um, the last one here on 13.4 is a tickler file, which is uh, kept in date order as a reminder file. And so basically tickler files um, sound creepy. <laughs> They thought that, that whole tickler file thing has creeped me out since 1998 when I first heard it in school. Um, but a tickler file is meant to tickle your brain um, and to remind you to do something. And so it's basically just a, a reminder to complete a task. All right, moving on to the end here. We have the filing process. So the first steps in filing are to inspect and release. Inspecting is sometimes called conditioning because it's basically the process of going through everything in the chart um, and getting all the stuff inside of it, all the info inside ready uh, for the file by getting rid of the paper clips and the staples and then shingling or laying out the information um, when it's appropriate. And then releasing basically consists of marking the document as ready to be filed because the doctor or the nurse practitioner or whoever it is that needs to see it, um, the counselor, the whoever, uh, licensed practitioner it is that you're working for, has seen the document and has completed any further actions needed uh, regarding it. We then go and uh, name the file according to the office policy, and that's indexing. Since the file uh, may be appropriate for several areas, sometimes we need to do a cross-reference um, to make sure that we have made, uh, named it the most appropriate name. And then we're going to code the document, sort it, and store it. So coding is identifying uh, uh, a mark or a phrase, making an identifying mark or phrase that will allow for appropriate placement. Then we'll sort it pri prior to filing to save time before the final step of storing it, which is putting it up on the shelves. So there's a whole lot of helpful uh, tips and guidelines uh, to assist with filing, but even with a really good filing system, files get lost and misplaced all the time. Let me tell you, when I, the first, well, up until 2014 or 2015, so three, four years ago, uh, every place I worked, we had paper charts, and paper charts got lost all the time. They were forever sitting on a doctor's desk, they were sitting on a nurse's desk, and we were forever losing charts. So people lose charts. It's just a hazard of having paper charts. And for those instances where a chart is lost, everybody should kind of get up and band together and help each other try to find it. So these helpful guidelines to prevent lost charts are to only take out uh, a file, check the file each time it's pulled, and then make sure that you return it right away after you're done with it, not leave charts piled up on your desk. Um, you want to not force and crowd documents into folders so that things don't get lost and fall out of it because it's over full. You want to file and cross-reference on a daily basis, not store files and equipment on the same shelf, and then make sure that the staff uh, knows how to use the filing system. 
Um, so when we're locating misplaced files, we want to make sure, first of all, if the file was accidentally placed, whether or not the file was accidentally placed with another file, or if it's sitting underneath something somewhere, or placed in an area that it wouldn't normally be, basically flip everything over and look for it. Uh, sometimes the file may have been filed by the first rather than the last name. That happens a lot because people um, sometimes forget. Also, too, sometimes people do not know how to spell and do not know how to alphabetize, and so they will put it in the wrong spot. And so that happens a lot. Um, so check there as well. It may help to stand back from the file cabinet to allow for a visual sweep to see a break in the color or numbering patterns. There may be a chance that the fi that helps a lot. That that works a lot actually. That one right there. Uh, there may be a chance that the file was gathered up with a person's other material and removed from the office. In those instances, you want to call immediately and make arrangements for the return of the file. That does not happen very often, and most of the time, when it does happen, if somebody realizes that they've brought a medical chart <laughs> home with them, you good over there? <laughs> My poor husband's trying to swallow his coughs. You good? Yeah, I know. Are you alright? We good? Alright. He's good, everyone. Uh, if the file is truly lost, uh, you want to, you have to make efforts to recreate the information, which super sucks, um, by calling labs and hospitals and other providers to get copies of all of the results and materials. So that's never fun. That is not a fun time. So we pray that it's not ever truly, truly lost. We pray that it's just misplaced. Uh, limiting medical record access is an easier process with the electronic method, method, but measures have to also be taken to protect the paper copy if necessary. So um, just kind of keep that in mind. All right, last part, uh, active and inactive closed files. Uh, so active files are anything that is too, has been used in the last two years. So those are files that are used frequently or is has been used in the last two years or less. Uh, anything that is inactive is uh, something that has been uh, used in has not been used in more than two years. Sometimes those are kept in an off-site storage facility. Um, sometimes people, some offices will keep them around for up to seven years. It just kind of depends on the office policy. Closed files are files that are no longer used, um, and those will pertain to patients who have died or moved away, um, and those are pretty often just kind of kept in the same area that the inactive files are kept. And so, um, you know, they're still around. We have to keep medical records for a period of seven years after the patient was last seen. And so um, we can't get rid of them. But we also don't oftentimes have the space to house them uh, readily either. So sometimes those um, inactive files and those closed files may be kept in an off-site storage. Uh, and this last part here, records retention, um, most places are required to keep for seven years, but the retention schedule will vary by office with many factors affecting how uh, or how long the length of, uh, how long, how many years the office keeps those records. The Federal False Claims Act requires financial records be kept for 10 years. The medical record can also uh, be kept for 10 years. Uh, it's probably recommended that it's kept for 10 years. Um, the the standard, as far as I know, is still 7 years. It's a recommendation for 10. Um, 10 is probably much more feasible now with the adaptation of uh, electronic health records, but 10 was a long time with, you know, tons and tons of paper charts sitting around. Uh, HIPAA has requirements for retention, as do states and insurance companies. The records must be com completely destroyed by shredding once we are no longer uh, required to retain them, though, and that is important. I will uh, note here for you that this is often, um, you are often, we are often required to 
have this done by a document shredding company. And um, that is uh, has been vetted to protect um, uh, patient health information. So by a vetted or a reputable, don't mind my sloppy handwriting, let me get rid of this. by a vetted um, document shredding company. So it, um, usually we'll contract out for those medical records to be shredded um, by somebody who has who specializes in shredding protected health information, which basically means that if it ever gets loose and is accessed by somebody, they can be sued for it, not us, not the practice. Uh, so there's several storage options for storing medical records. Uh, storage options are different for paper than they are for computer. Paper storage is usually done uh, with uniform size boxes labeled very carefully for uh, retrieval. We can also scan things, put them on um, CDs, DVDs, flash drives, external hard drives. Those are all space saving alternatives. Scanning documents uh, takes a really long time, but it's a much better alternative than trying to retype everything into a computer, so there's that. Uh, storage of those inactive and closed files must remain secure and safe from hazards such as fire and water damage. Um, and then lastly, storage must be locked to ensure privacy and confidentiality are maintained. So that is uh, pretty much the gist of paper charting and paper medical records for uh, chapter 13. And I think, let me get over here. That is it. Is that it? Yeah, I think that's it. I think we're good there. So if you guys have any questions about that, you know where to find me, right? Um, and uh, for real though, if you want to see those lovely charts, uh, come over to my office in GE 109 uh, this semester. I'm hanging out over there. Uh, I don't know when I'm there. Check the syllabus. I think Wednesdays. All right. Thanks, guys.